Doubt is an enemy of healing. And I want to teach you how to defeat that enemy. I'm going to show you how to defeat doubt. Now, in this series, I've been talking about keys to the healing ministry, and I'm talking to those who believe that God has called them as vessels of His healing power in the earth, and I believe that's you. But being in this healing ministry, being in the healing ministry of Jesus, you're going to find doubt come in many forms. And I want to show you what you need to do with doubt. I want to show you what Jesus did with doubt. And I know it's going to strengthen the healing ministry that God has given to you. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here. He's going to lead you in some anointed worship. And then we're going to get right into this lesson here. Is Stephen Moctezuma. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. So in part two of this series, I really went down the line and answered the question, biblically speaking, why aren't some healed? And I gave you four biblical reasons as to why some aren't healed. Now, even though someone may find these reasons in the Bible and they may mentally understand them, they may still struggle emotionally with the problem of the very reality that surrounds them of those who are not healed. And that reality really is what causes those emotions to be stirred. Because as you pray for the sick, there will be times that you lay hands on them and they are not healed. I've prayed for people who were not healed. I've prayed for people who have died of the sicknesses that I rebuked. Now, does this mean that it's not God's will to heal? It's not what I'm saying. It just means that we have to leave room for the sovereignty of God. So if you're someone who wrestles with those questions, take a look at what I taught on part two of this series, How to Heal the Sick, just biblical answers to the question, why aren't some healed? But nevertheless, after you've wrestled with all of the questions and asked, after you've gone back and forth in your mind with the information, you are faced with making a decision. How do you respond when what you experience seems to contradict what the Bible declares? Do you believe your experience because it's happening? Or do you believe the Bible? Now, this really is the issue for most people. I mean, I've prayed for people who wouldn't even tell me what their sicknesses were. I don't know how many times I've said, what am I praying for? 
They said, just, just believing, just in faith. I said, well, what do you have? I don't have a sickness, they would say. Well, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me. Then why are you in a line for healing? Just pray for me, they'll say. And it gets really confusing. Why? Because they think that if they speak it, that they're causing it. But that's not the type of superstition I'm talking about. Superstition has no power. I'm talking about truth. And so we have to avoid that extreme of not naming it or walking around in this paranoia of if I acknowledge a sickness, or if I acknowledge that a situation doesn't seem to be going as planned, then therefore I am contributing to it with doubt. That's not doubt. That's just acknowledging the facts. Faith does not deny reality, but it does address reality. And so in those instances where you find yourself wondering about the healing of someone that didn't occur, you have to make the decision of ultimately trusting in the Word of God. Now again, I dealt with more of the theology and the technicalities and some of the things that may help you mentally on part two of this series. On this one, I want to help you deal with the emotion of it or the soul element of it, that, that something inside of you that acts as a barrier, a fear that prevents you from ministering God's healing power. So never allow the miracles you don't receive prevent you from seeing the miracles you should receive. In other words, what God doesn't do that I expect Him to do will not stop me from believing for what can be. Ultimately, nothing is impossible with God. Our partnership with the Lord comes down to be rather simple. I do the possible. He does the impossible. If I will worship, His presence will be made manifest. If I will preach, souls will be saved. If I will give, He will bless. If I will lay hands on the sick, He will heal them. It's up to Him from there. And so, again, while the questions may be addressed intellectually, we may still struggle with the problem of the reality emotionally. And so, I can recall my own experience with this area of doubt because when I was 14 years old or so, about 11 years old actually, I first saw these two evangelists that were just dynamic and powerful. One of them was very stoic and solemn and serious. And another one was very joyful and loose. And he was very funny, actually, quite comedic. And I, could, I wish I could tell you some of the stories, but time won't allow. But he was just a very, very funny man. Now, I watched both of these two men, opposite ends of the spectrum, speaking in personality, uh, terms of personality. Both of these men on opposite ends of the spectrum, one real serious, one real silly. And I thought, God could use both of these men who are so different from each other. And I realized then, it's not about personality. Both of these men are just surrendered in faith to the Holy Spirit. And that's when I knew that I knew that I knew. And I know you've had moments like this. I knew that I knew that I knew I was called to the healing ministry. And so I watched these men for years. One of the men, the men who was a little more on the comedic side, developed MS. It's a multiple, it's, it's, a, it's a disease where your muscles begin to deteriorate and it affects multiple systems, multiple parts of the body. And I watched as this man went from using canes to move around to using a wheelchair to eventually not being able to move any part of his body on his own. Now here's the thing, this man was in the healing ministry. He prayed for the sick. I watched him from his wheelchair laying hands on the sick and God healing people. And then in my own ministry, I would see people healed of the same diseases that he, he was said to have had. The same sickness he had, MS, I've seen it healed multiple times in the ministry where they come back with reports and everything. And I thought, God, why didn't you do it for him? In fact, I remember being there on his, with him on his deathbed. He was on his deathbed. And I remember him just lying there looking up looking up at the ceiling and you know, there's a blank stare on his face and he's just praying in tongues, worshiping God. And I thought, Lord, why didn't you heal him? He's in the healing ministry. Your power flowed through him. I could name healing evangelists after healing evangelists who had issues with it. Catherine Coleman had heart trouble. I think of many great evangelists who've gone home to be with the Lord as a result of sicknesses that were healed in their own ministries. How do you deal with this? How do you reconcile this? Well, again, I address the intellectual portion of it in part two. And right here in part three, I want to talk about how to defeat this doubt, how to, what to do with it. So Mark chapter five, beginning at verse number 35, this is what the scripture says. 
While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. So here Jesus makes a statement of faith, declaring, in fact, that he has the power to raise her from this sleep. And look at how the people responded to him. The crowd laughed at him, so they mocked him to scorn, the King James Version says. But I want you to see what Jesus did to the mockers. But he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. How did Jesus deal with doubt? He simply put doubt out. Doubt is like a fire. Now, I'm not saying don't ask questions. I'm not saying don't research. In fact, I believe that the more questions you ask, especially when they pertain to Scripture, that the closer you become to truth. Don't be afraid of questions. The only ones who are afraid of questions are the ones who don't have the truth. But doubt is not questioning. That's curiosity. That's the thirst for knowledge and revelation. And that's okay. Doubt is this sense of distrust, this feeling of distrust toward God's Word and what He has said. Now, doubt begins as a small flicker, a little ember. And if you allow it to grow, it becomes a raging inferno that is difficult to put out. It destroys faith. It destroys that sense of wonder. It destroys that sense of awe. It burns away at the life and the vegetation that is your faith and leaves in its place a scorched land that is dry and useless. So doubt must be addressed. And doubt, as I said earlier, can come in many forms. It can come in the form of a skeptic sitting at the front row while you're preaching. It can come in the form of questions. It can come in the form of depression and heavy emotions that you carry as a result of seeing someone not receive their healing. It can result or come about through worry. It can come about through others speaking into your life negatively. Now again, to balance what I'm saying, I'm not saying that we need to walk around denying sickness. I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. That's it's nonsense. If you're not sick, you wouldn't need a healing and therefore you wouldn't be declaring that in the first place. It's circular reasoning and it's nonsense and it's superstition. I'm talking about doubt that comes on as distrust in the Word of God. That is what you must dismiss. That is what you must kick out. So while I do allow myself to ask questions, I don't allow myself to doubt the character of God. Well, I do allow myself to analyze the situation, I don't allow myself to stop believing the Word of God. Doubt must be addressed. Doubt is intimidating. Doubt is loud. Doubt likes to shout, but the Holy Spirit can whisper. And when He whispers, His whispers are more powerful than all the shouts of doubt around you. So intimidating spirits hang around with spirits of doubt. The spirit of intimidation is that feeling of inferiority that you get when you share the gospel or pray for the sick. Some people carry it on them. Have you ever gone to pray for someone and you can just feel their cynicism? You can just feel their doubt? You can just feel them looking down upon you? That is their in spirit of intimidation, their spirit of contradiction or doubt trying to come upon you and make you feel small and make you shrink back. This is what the people did. They laughed at Jesus. They laughed at his power. He kicked them out. You have to do the same. 
You have to say to yourself, I will not allow doubt in. In fact, I've done it to where people in my services, and in fact, a great man of God taught me, he said, there will be times when you're preaching that people on the front row want to challenge the anointing. They stand there with their arms folded and they just look at you. And they're basically saying, impress me or prove, me, prove to me that you're the real deal. They're not there to receive. They're there to cause trouble. And what I'll do, I'll just have a move. I'll say, excuse me, sir, I need you to move to the back and someone else come up to the front. And I'll pick someone who looks like they're filled with faith and move into the front row. Why? Because the spirit of doubt, the spirit of intimidation is defeated by bold and audacious faith. People that challenge the anointing, I push right back. People that try to be cynical and laugh and mock, I push right back with bold and audacious faith. There have been times where people are sitting in the back row. And I remember just in a couple of services ago, someone's sitting in the back row. They're watching and you can tell they're just kind of doubting and analyzing everything. And so instead of just letting that continue, I said, Lord, speak to me about that man. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge. I went all the way to the back of the church, went right at him and said, sir, you didn't expect me to come to you, but this is what God says. It broke him. The man began to cry. Why? Because doubt was broken. That intimidation was broken. They may not even realize they're exuding that persona, but it is a spiritual thing. So do as Jesus did and put it out. Be bold, be audacious, be confrontational with that spirit. Not with people, with that spirit. Don't allow it anywhere near your mind. Don't allow it to take root. Again, yes, it's okay to ask questions. You should be asking questions. It's okay to study the Word of God and search for answers. You should be studying the Word of God. But never allow that intellectual battle for information to become an emotional distrust of God's power. Put out doubt. Defeat doubt. You do that by simply resisting the thoughts that come that are full of doubt, resisting the people that come against you, and resisting everything that would speak against what the Word of God clearly teaches. And that is it for the lesson. I want to pray with you now. I'm going to pray that the Lord would break doubt from you, that you would be free, and that you would be discerning to know when doubt is trying to come and make its return into your life. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one now who is receiving this prayer and believing for breakthrough in the area of doubt. Lord, give them the peace of mind and the peace of heart that they need. Reveal your truth to them and calm the mind. And reveal your faith and your spirit to them to calm the soul. I thank you, precious Jesus, that you taught us to put out doubt. You taught us to remove it from us. And I pray now, Lord, that that be broken off that one receiving this prayer. And I thank you, Father. Wow, there's a healing river that just began to flow. Some of you, as you were set free from doubt, the river began to flow. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Just receive that healing. Don't, don't, don't. Don't overanalyze this moment. Just receive. Some of you are feeling something coming on you, and you've never really felt that before. That's the power of God. See, you're not watching by accident. Lord, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that angels encamp around us. I thank you, Lord, that your presence fills this place. Let your glory fill their house, Lord. Wherever they are, let your glory fill that place. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we rebuke sickness and disease in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I know this one's odd, but there was someone who was watching me. You were doubting, and you said, Lord, if it's really you, have them call out, and I see someone with an issue with your tooth. And as small as that is in your mind, you wanted it as a sign, and the Lord has called it out. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. I give you the glory. In fact, just when I said that now, there are more people saying, Lord, well, if you did it for them, do it for me. This is him doing it for you right now. I thank you, Jesus, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, breaking every sickness and disease. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want you to say it because you agree. Say, Amen. Well, I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you like information on how you can join the Spirit family, 
Use the information at the bottom of the screen. Remember, it's 100% free to join the Spirit family. You're going to get a free weekly teaching, fresh revelation, fresh teachings from the Word of God every single Sunday morning to your e email inbox. And then you're going to be able to reply to that email for prayer support from my staff. And you'll be joining the Spirit family, which contains members from the body of Christ all around the world, almost 3,000 of us now. I want to read the comments now from Stephen Moctezuma's cover of I Stand in Awe of You. And I want to take this opportunity. If you've not checked out Stephen Moctezuma's playlist, you absolutely need to go do yourself a favor and go look at it. Just very, very anointed. Karen Webb writes, Thank you, brother. Very beautiful and very humble. Melanie Marquez says, I'm thankful to be blessed by Stephen's ministry. And yes, God, I stand in awe of you. Another commenter writes, I'm really blessed with this song. While I was busy doing my daily chores, my heart was singing this song. And when I picked up my cell phone, I saw a notification in my screen with this song. Wow. My heart wants to cry for God because he always reminded me how great and powerful he is. Yes, I stand in awe of you, Father God. I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. Beatrice writes, Your song selection is so nice. May the Lord continue using you and bless you mightily. And Tina Marie writes, Thank you, Stephen, for blessing us with worship songs and music. You can just feel the love of Jesus through your music. The Holy Spirit is using you in a mighty way. Blessings to you and the Spirit Church family. And we want to expand not just the healing ministry where you see me ministering and teaching. We want to expand the worship ministry of Stephen Moctezuma. And here's where I need your help. You know that we're in the middle of a campaign right now, actually toward the end of the campaign now, where we need a thousand new $30 a month supporters. Now, let me show you where we are and then let me show you, let me tell you where that support's going to go. Take a look on the screen. We needed a thousand new $30 a month supporters and this is where we are now. We are so close to that goal. I can just sense in my spirit, we're going to wrap this up in the next couple of months. I think by the end of the year, we'll be done with this campaign. So that's where we are in the campaign. Now, what is that for? That's to move us into our new facility and to help us do more events. But I want to just talk about the facility for now. Just to reiterate, it's going to help us do more events, more places all around the world, more miracle services in all the nations, all the states. Let's do it, guys. But I want to talk to you about the building because we're very close to getting favor in this area. We have, we've had favor every step of the way. So the monthly costs are going to take care of the monthly, uh, the monthly support, I should say, is going to take care of the monthly cost for the building. There are two costs when getting a building. There is the one-time move-in cost and there are the monthly cost of sustaining everything. So one-time cost, that's renovation, that's permits, that's um, down payments, all of that. And that will get us in. The monthly cost, what we're raising right now, will keep us in. So please listen carefully. I really want you to hear my heart on this because I want you to understand the campaign. When you get a property, it can sometimes take you a while to get the permits to do what you need to do. But you need to get the property before you can get the permits. So it's kind of a catch-22. So here's how it works. You get the property, you apply for the permits, and you get the permits as you build according to their standards, the city standards. So that means that we need to pay rent day one, as soon as we're in there. And we may be paying rent for several months before we can even use it because we have to build and renovate. That's why we're raising the monthly costs to help get us that monthly support so we can stay in there while we build with the one-time costs. Now, we're almost done with the monthly costs, and then we can move on to raising the renovation costs, which will be much faster because it's not monthly support, just one-time donations. So help us finish this campaign. You've been saying, I want to do that. I'm blessed by the ministry. I'm receiving from it. Do that today. Don't delay. We need you to sign up. Finish that off, and then we can turn our attention to the renovations, which is very exciting because you're going to get to see updates. You're going to start to see uh, things actually being built, and that is a very exciting time. But first, we need to raise this monthly so we can get in and pay for that building while we build. So we're almost done with the monthly. Let's finish this off now. Look, it was less than 100, I believe. And I believe that by the time this airs, if the stats are holding true, by the time this airs, it's quite possible we can finish this off in just this one video. So sign up, become a $30 a month supporter. I'll send you as an initiation gift for partnering with me. 
either carriers of the glory or 25 truths about demons and spiritual warfare. I will sign it as my gift to you, initiation gift, and then you're partnered with us and we're going to and stay with us for the long haul. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, stay to the very end. You're going to see a button that you can click. If you're watching this on the app, watch it till the end. The video will go away and you'll see a button that you can click. If you're watching this anywhere else, use the information at the bottom of the screen. Now, imagine this with me. A brand new television studio. We're live broadcasting. We can live stream from the studio from there. There are seats for a studio audience where you can come and sit under the ministry, the worship ministry of Stephen Moctezuma. He'll lead you live in person in worship. And I'll go there and teach you a word live in person. Well, we continue to also do all, all that we do. We'll add that to it. Can you see it? We're going to reach more souls than ever before. I know it and it's going to be big. Be a part of it today. Sign up as soon as this video is done. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.